At the outset, it gives me immense pleasure in welcoming one and all present here to this online webinar entitled Right to Equality, Does It Apply to Women? organized by the National Cadet Corps, Providence College for Women under the 5 Tamil Nadu Girls Battalion Coimbatore Group. Uh, the resource person for today is Dr. Annie Vijaya, Deputy Inspector General, Trichy Range. Uh, I would call upon Josen Ranjit. Not just that I'm calling a normal student to introduce to us the chief guest of the day. Let me quote a few points about this young boy who would introduce the chief guest to us. He is um, awarded with an honorary doctorate in writing at Chennai last year. And he's also honored with the Kalam Book of World Records Golden Award last year. And this year he's got the Youth Education Icon of Tamil Nadu and the Man of Excellence Award at New Delhi. So may I request uh, Mr. Josen Ranjit to introduce the chief guest of the day. Thank you. A very charming evening to one and all. Mm, I take a privilege to share about few things about our honorable chief guest. And really, to say in a poetic line, our chief guest is uh, intense. She say yes when others say no. And she rise while others are sleeping. She do while others cannot do. She have a controlled passion. And she is on a quest to support young minds and most probably young minds of youth girls. I think this is enough as an introduction and I offer my time to our honorable guest itself to have a great interaction as well as a great speech with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Josin. Over to you, ma'am. A oh, very good morning to you all. It has been a pleasure to hear to Professor Sithya George as, uh, in one line spoken, uh, very appreciative of the young writer, Dr. so-called uh, title Joshan Ranjit. And he has also spoken in a very valuable means the, the way he has to describe a person and how to motivate them and inspire them to do this uh, speaking a uh, lot. And today on uh, this topic, speaking about the right to equality, whether it applies to women, the uh, topic itself is a debatable one. When it was proposed to me, I was wondering whether this topic is really a, a, a theme to be talked about, argued about, or whether it has to be talked about. Because now, almost completed my graduation since about uh, past 25 years, and I remember the day in the college when we were talking about right to equality, freedom of women, freedom of an expression of women, the women's status, the women empowerment, the feminist, and so many things about uh, our women should achieve. And we've also seen women achievers. But then this basic constitutional right, right to equality, it is almost about 70 years that we have framed our constitution. And everybody knows that in India, we have not only the best constitution, but the best policy makers who have done so well the constitution that it has been internationally appreciated and today but for the very existence of this constitution many walks of life many sections of life would not be able to survive and live their life with dignity and with security and with safety and with all protections giving them the very charm of life and now coming to the point about this uh, right to equality and the constitution this has to be spoken in terms of women empowerment today we are speaking about the empowering of the women the status of women the freedom of women the achievement of women and above all besides all the constitutional provisions besides all the rights besides all the freedoms yet we are today fighting for justice fighting for the community fighting for the safety fighting for the protection of women so now I go over to share my uh, PPT in this connection to have an overview, a bird's eye view of the women's empowerment under the constitutional safeguards given to us. So once again, a good day to all of you. 
I am Dr. Z. Ani Vijay, IPS, Deputy Inspector General of Police for the Tirchi Range. I have been into this service for nearly about 22 years. And my background is I am a, a student of the Madras University with criminology uh, uh, department. And I've been specializing into victimology. And I also have a passion for the gender studies. And now going over to the constitutional safeguards and the women empowerment, I like to share this uh, PowerPoint, which has been made by another person who has a passion for women, who has a passion for women respects and women rights. So basically to tell you about what is women empowerment. Everybody is clamoring for this word empowerment, for this power, for this rightful living, for this dignified living. Basically, women empowerment means every person has to live with dignity, every person has to live with honor, and above all, they have to have the right to live, the right to be born as a female, the right to live as a female child, and the right to live as a woman. This right itself is being discriminated from the days of not just today or yesterday, from the days of laws of manuscripti, which in the recent days has also been put to so many clamors and so many debates. Still, if one remembers, you might remember the law of Manusmiti, which says, from birth to death, we are nothing but a liability, uh, not a credibility, but a very liability and a, not an assessment, not an accessibility, but a burden on a man's shoulder. Because the day we are born, the father thinks that we are a burden on him. As we grow up, the mother also feels so protective about us. The man around us, being the brother or the brother in any form, they always feel that we have to be tied down and hence we have always been tied on with a lot of jewelry around our necks, around our ears, around our feet, around our heads and above all to ensure that we are only chained with golden chains so that they ensure that we do not run away from the system which is basically nothing but a patriarchal system which ensures that nothing is there for us to do but say a, a, just a common yes, just to say a yes, put down our heads put down our eyes to the ground and say yes to all the nonsense in the world. So generally women empowerment means we have to look in these five areas, discrimination, which means gender discrimination, education of the female, female infanticide, the dowry system which is prevalent and the child marriage. These five areas have always been an issue for all the women speakers, for all the platform around the world. And recently we have also been speaking about the November 25th, which has been uh, declared as International Day for the elimination of all forms of violence against women. And despite our, despite our Independence Day, till today, we are still, still speaking about the protection of women, violence against women, the violence which is uh, posted against women, and the POXO cases which are rising high and, uh, high and, uh, and at a very fast rate, and all forms of violence, all forms of forces, all forms of uh, gender discriminations and problems which are against women, torture, harassment, and the ill feelings that are generated against women just because they are your women. So the Constitution of India, which has been framed some years back, as I told you, and as you all remember, it is in the 1950s, the November 26, because of a Dr. Ambedkar who has given us this Constitution, the entire Indian society with all its citizens I've been very happy and so much so for the women lot who have always been a given a great status in this society from the very beginning. So the preamble itself, it clearly assures that there is justice socially, economically, politically, guaranteeing equality of status and opportunity and dignity to the individual. This means that all men, all women are equal before law, before the constitution. The constitution is the which is the basic framework of the law of the land and which is the highest institution and the sanctum sanctorum of the entire law of the land. So therefore speaking about the fundamental rights, you all know very well that uh, chapter 3 which speaks about the fundamental rights gives or spells out the rights for all the individuals, of the Indians, which speaks about the fundamental rights which are preserved in the constitution and this also includes the rights of the women, which means empowerment for them, welfare for them, rights of the women, so that they can also live with dignity. They can also live their life with safety. 
they can also live in security they also feel protected and above all they feel that they are a dignified human beings on the laws of the land so article 14 everybody in this world every student every person they know very well about this article 14 article 14 means ensuring right to of equality equality means equality before the law you have a free fair unbiased impartial trial existence right to speak right to expression right to live as you wish right to dress right to talk to anybody right as you wish any right which is not written out by any of the writs of the of the constitution however still today we still have to clap for the right to equality for the women lot because in a patriarchal system as in tamil nadu which is different from that of uh, kerala we still have to clamor for our right clamor for our existence we have to fight we have to survive the survival we have to fight to be born we have to fight to live we have to fight to exist we have to fight to show that we are nothing but human beings only thing is that we are women because of our gene so article 151 gives a protection which prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex this has been given and this has been already taken into account because the framers of the constitution knew very well that from the very beginning though there has been a common framework for all the citizens certain weaker sections of the society particularly the women and the children have to be protected have to be given an upliftment hence this provision on the article 51 clearly speaks about the prohibition of discrimination based on the basis of sex and hence it gives a protection for the women saying that there cannot be any discrimination on the basis of sex therefore in the employment cadre in the education sector in any form of this institution or in any organized or unorganized sector or in any walk of life there is always the special provision for the women lot for the gender lot for the female lot giving them the special protection special uh, privileges special uh, uh, special legal rights and framework which allows them to come out so that they can on par with the other sex with the other gender they can also compete and rise up to the society's expectation and again article 153 it speaks about the empowerment of the state to take positive actions which are in favoring women so women in gender have to be given all protection all support all assistance because of the fact that women by and large are facing lot of discriminations by and large they have to compete in a man's world by and large they have to prove that they are equal and more capable of more competent and more efficient and effective than the men lot not to say that men are less but still women to stand in this world means 100% not enough it has to be 1000% and above all we need to have the support of the man world we need to have the support of the law we need to have the support of the socialists we need to have the support of the education and above all we need to have the support of the almighty so article 16 which goes to speak about the equality of the opportunity for all citizens which relates either in the aspect of employment or appointment all these are there in letter in black and white but in spirit and mind we have to clamor we have to fight we have to show that we are also equally legible eligible and we are also having all the credentials and the potentials and all the educational qualifications to be employed to be appointed it is it might be so easy to say when i speak about the article 14 article 151 article 153 article 16 and the other articles which are there in the chapter 3 of the fundamental rights but still when it comes to real reality when it comes to real fighting uh, basis it is on merits but more on merits it is the question whether you are a man or a female so the directive principles of the state policy which are endeavored in the chapter 4 of the constitution it is nothing but about the speaking about the welfare of policies of the state which are there as a principal guidance 
so that they ensure that the all the citizens of the land are given all the schemes all the welfare militias all the policies so that they give upliftment they give the dual consideration they give them the opportunity they give them the uh, rightful uh, rights and the uh, responsibilities so that they have a place in the society to also establish themselves as a potential person in the world and again under this scheme we have the women empowerment which needs to be given specific uh, consideration because again being a women being a female being a girl being a born a female it means that we have to fight keep fighting keep fighting and continue to oppose and be opposed and uh, uh, cross the hurdle and finish the race the race is just the beginning we are running the race for life together for years together and the end of the rope is still the beginning of another rope so article 39a again speaks about the state to ensure that it has a policy for securing for men and women equally the rights to adequate means of livelihood every person born in this uh, society every person born in this land need to have a decent living a decent kind of a livelihood they have to have the opportunity to have that livelihood so that they live with dignity and they live with honor they live with a protection to their self protection of life and protection of the property so this is the principle of the article 39a 39d again it provides for equal uh, pay for equal work and this applies to both men and women so at every point of the constitution it is very clear that we need to emphasize that all these provisions that all these securities that all these policies are may are geared and directed towards both men and women and women automatically covered under the all the constitutional frameworks of the fundamental rights all the directive principles of the state policy which ensures for the uh, appropriate uh, protection of the citizen of this society but however still with all this uh, framework with all these laws of the land with all these policies with all the special provisions still women have to fight because the day is not yet reached where we can safely say that we are none other than a, another human being on this society so article 42 it speaks about the state giving provision for making just and human conditions of work and especially for maternity relief i will discuss in uh, detail in the following acts which is to follow the next provision so already as i told you the fundamental rights we are speaking about fundamental equality we have touched about we have also spoken about the directive principles of the state policy for the welfare of the citizens now speaking about the fundamental duties which are enshrined in the part 4a uh, of the constitution which means that these are duties of the state of the welfare society of the welfare government to ensure that all the citizens of the land are having a positive duties and they work for the welfare of the society so that all men all women all citizens every human being in this law of the land in the society are having all the protection they en they enjoy all the rights they enjoy all the protections they enjoy all the responsibilities and they are in a welfare oriented society and this applies equally and more so to the women so article 51a again speaks about the expectation of the citizens of the country to promote harmony and the spirit of the common brotherhood amongst all the people of the india and to ensure that there are no practices which are derogatory to the dignity of women so in summary in brief to speak about 70 years back the framers of a constitution knowing very well the social codification the norms the ethics the values and the principles of the society have delved deep into the laws of the land and ensured that in the constitution particularly the indian constitution which provides for equality of all men and this includes equality to women safety to women security to women protection to women social policies which are directed for their welfare for their affirmation for their positive growth for their achievements and for their upliftment in the society in general 
for the women empowerment ensuring that women are empowered legally constitutionally emotionally biologically physiologically with the support of the constitutional framework of the law of the land in india so in connection with this we can also have an overview of certain laws which have been which have been enforced and drawn and which have been uh, framed for the empowerment of women in india these laws are there for the safety of women so that they have a special uh, privileges special uh, seeking justice and an upper hold over the others which gives them the special status a special uh, concern a focused concern for the protection of their rights for their very existence for their very existence in the society as a dignified lot so the first uh, act we may look into this equal remuneration act which uh, goes back to 1976 and the aim of this act is to provide for the payment of equal remuneration to all workers be it men or women and for the prevention of discrimination on the ground of sex this itself is been embodied in the principle of the fundamental rights in chapter 3 in uh, 15 3 clause which provides for discrimination on the ground of sex so again to reinforce this we have a uh, this equal remuneration act so wherever women are employed in the organized sector or in the unorganized sector it is to ensure that they get payment on par with men and it is also to ensure that there is no discrimination based on the grounds that of sex there is no discrimination at all so the principle that every law of the land every man of the land every human being is said to free fair unbiased impartial delivery of all justice and this is a very common uh, act the dowry prohibition act it is dated to 1961 and with the latest amendment 61 it is today 2020 still we are having cases of dowry prohibition the dowry being uh, demanded from the uh, bridegroom side on the bride side the bride being chased away there is clamor for their very existence there is clamor for their maintenance there is clamor for their very existence as a very human being despite all these laws all these acts still women are crying in silence their voice is not being heard they are uh, the injustice is being delivered to them and still they are not able to come out and the very sorry state of affairs of this uh, of this uh, situation is that even the educated even the very highly placed women are so much so in a pandemic situation in a very chaotic situation like a pandora's box being opened up they feel that they are not being taken care of because of the insensitivity of the bridegroom and the family side because of the indifference because of the attitude of the bridegroom side and still we are lacking in bringing up our men bringing up our boys bringing up our boys the man in this world to make them understand that women are no less or women are nothing different from them because in every family there is a girl either in the form of a mother either in the form of a wife or either in the form of a sister but still when the other girls from comes from a different family we have a different attitude we have a different treatment and above all we don't forget to understand that this girl is going to be the carrier of a generation the generation to come and she is going to be the most important pivotal center of the entire family which means that the existence of the family the happiness of the family lies at this girl's hand speaking about the third act which relates to the immoral traffic prevention act 1956 this is a very sad story we have the sex trafficking in our country which has been a social taboo from years together man has been a social animal man has been an independent animal and we have been seeing this form of uh, injustices and a form of a very crude form of an animal form of a crime being uh, imposed upon the gender of female just because she is looked upon as a commercial uh, object a sex exploitation object a happiness object 
and we look upon that as an object and hence we think that as an object of happiness she is an object of to give pleasure to give happiness to the man's world which cannot be tolerated and more so under this act we have the agents we have the pimps we have the brokers who are the uh, who are the accused who are now being booked for they being uh, tying up all these victims together and above all even if to rescue these victims we have the other aspect where we have the problem of the rehabilitation of these victims the reintegration of these victims into society because it is not an easy uh, uh, easy happening even if we rescue them there are the other groups where they call upon them because they have already been into this uh, trade they call them to be used again as a sex trade and they call them to be used that they cannot be in the normal life there are no helpers no assistance to take these victims into their life and to reintegrate them into the society is a been a process age old still still we have been thinking about the three hours in the punishment theory we are speaking about the rehabilitation reintegration resocialization yes we have the rehabilitation schemes yes we have the reintegration schemes we have the resocialization themes but we need to have a change in the perception of the society we need to have a change in the attitude of the society we need to have a complete change in the attitude so that we can accept these victims as part of a family and take them back into our society as a newly formed uh, reformed child and take them make them live as a human being as any other human beings as any other women in the world the maternity benefit act of 1961 again this is there to give all the pro uh, protection and the provisions for the women who are working in the establishments and the institutions because despite all these maternity benefits still the women are finding it very difficult to avail their uh, maternity benefits their child care provisions and other assistance which are being there because of the nature of their work sometimes becomes very difficult to uh, avail this but i insist that this maternity benefit should be implemented in spirit and in letter and above all as a passionate human being we should ensure that they are given all assistance so that they will be able to bring up the youth the future generation in a very positive manner the medical termination of pregnancy act which i am totally against it but still for medical reasons we can make use of this and again this act is very important where there are cases of rape victims there are the cases of pokso cases where the child or the girl without a consent becomes a victim of rape and thereafter she also becomes pregnant and this is genetically not allowed biologically not allowed medically not allowed and also as a social taboo not allowed we may enforce this pregnancy act but this should not be used for other purposes for their individual benefits the commission of sati prevention act 1987 i am sure that this is not there in tamil nadu but i am also again very sad to say that this is being happening in certain pockets of kadalur certain pocket, pockets of the vilippuram area and in also certain pockets of the uh, uslampatti areas of madurai area where there are also incidences of uh, female infanticide in uslampatti child marriage is happening in ariyal district child marriage is happening in uh, kadalur district so still all these practices are still continuing in uh, in our state in all pockets of district mostly these details go unreported they are the dark figure of crime and we continue but uh, one moment ma'am once ah yes ma'am yes ma'am so regarding this commission of sati act 1987 as i already have uh, discussed with you this is uh, also a continuing feature in our uh, in our state and it is a very sad feature that this happens to be continuing despite the uh, act which is there has been uh, practices which has to be uh, completely eradicated after the independence day but still we are having this practices because of the fact that women are looked upon as a burden women as lo are looked upon as a an object of sex women as looked upon as a commercial uh, commodity and above all it is always a liability and not an accessibility so therefore this sati which is the most uh, uh, atrocious act of crime which can be committed upon a woman especially in a land which is so much so giving respect for the women in the in the society in the religious affairs in all the uh, family affairs in all the honors and in all the platforms still we have to say sati means not sati but sapti 
So the next act in continuation also, it's a prohibition of child marriage act. We are having cases being reported where the child welfare committee always gives us cases of uh, uh, children below 16 years getting married and they bring us a report even at the age of 14 and 15 there are cases of children with the uh, pregnancy delivered premature babies and there are also cases where children after delivery they do not survive the life and along with the newborn baby they are dying and this is a feature which is very common and also in Ariello district i'm also that this feature of uh, instances of cases gets reported in uh, uh, Karlo district and then also some parts of uh, some parts of uh, Uslampati. So me as a research scholar when I stated way back in 91-93 my specialization was on to female infanticide and protection of women and the gender uh, cases. It was a shocking, uh, not a shocking but a very sad state of affairs to understand that despite me passing out of the college, finishing my PG, finishing my PhD and also being into a service of the protective legal enforcement. After almost about 25 years, I'm still hearing cases of child marriage, still hearing cases of female infanticide, still hearing cases of sexual harassment, and still hearing cases of sati, which we means that all our research, all our theory are nothing but theory, and none of what is important to that there is safety for the women, protection for the women, security for the women, for the upliftment of the women and above all speaking about the real empowerment of women. About the uh, discrimination of women, we make use of this technique, the scientific technique to ensure that we do not get a female uh, gender because most of the families are biased to having a case of uh, uh, female being born. Still, in the last uh, 2019 itself, I had three cases of female infanticide being reported in Muslimpati area and now recently even in Narialur I had some cases of two to three cases of uh, female infanticide being reported. These cases are only those cases which are being reported and there is always in the statistics aspect the dark figure of the crime, the unreported crime, the underworld crime, the statistic itself is only the tip of the iceberg as far as women crimes are, uh, are related to the women issues because these voices are only those voices who come out and speak out. There are a lot of voices who are still uh, in uh, pain, in uh, distress, in uh, tremor, in uh, sadness, in torture, in 100% for which we need to walk a long while, draw a long line and ensure that we deliver justice to them. And the talk of the entire world the look of the entire world is the sexual harassment of women at workplaces, the Prevention and Protection Act, which I remember is the Vishaka guidelines. And I'm also happy to share that my PhD topic was on the sexual harassment of women in the unorganized sector. When I started this way back in about 93-94 uh, with my PhD registration, I had a lot of uh, difficulty, a lot of research uh, problems, a lot of hypothetical problems, and at long I had to have a long argumental sessions and discussions and debates with my uh, seniors because the tool was not fixed the collection of data was not fixed i had to follow very sensitive data and i had opportunity also have a, a small sample study regarding the uh, harassment of women traveling by the public transport which gave me an eye opener to say that every woman every student every girl who was traveling in the public transport is subject to some form of harassment, be it uh, non-physical harassment, which may be looking like giggling, uh, teasing, or winking. Then you have the physical harassment. Then you have the more post-harassment. Then you have the pressured harassment. And it has a lot of links, which I am very happy to express now. It is an interesting topic because of my subject of sexual harassment. I had an exposure to interact with many students, with many uh, elderly persons. And all children who are females from uh, the age of six to the age of six are a victim of sexual harassment at one point of the time or the other. This is the hypothesis which I would conclude. And again, this also is related to our way of approach, way of attitude, way of interaction, way of dressing, way of uh, uh, giving the 
flew to the opposite side. So everything in all, it means that the attitude of the society, the attitude of the individual, and above all, the very concept of the society has to be tuned to understand that more men and women are none other but better halves or better halves, but still we form the, so as a whole, the whole, uh, the whole means the man and the women, each balancing each other, understanding each other, and become because of the uh, because of the infusion of the man and the women, and we also should understand man are no different from women, women are no different from the man, but this balance has to be maintained, peaceful coexistence for both men and women at work, at home, at society, and of course as a human being, as a dignified person, as an honored person, as a true citizen of India. And in this society, where it says all men, all men, all women are equal before law, equal before the eyes of law, are having equal rights, fundamental rights, right to freedom. You have the rights, you have the responsibilities, you have the duties, you have the directive principles working on you. And then you should say Jai Hind to the constitution and should say, I'm happy to be born as an Indian. I'm happy to be born in this Tamil Nadu. I'm happy to be here in, here in South India. So with this work, I thank you for this uh, aspect on constitution. Along with this, I'd like to make one other uh, presentation which is linked to this women empowerment. Ten minutes, Cynthia. Ten minutes. Cynthia, another ten minutes, please. Yes, yes ma'am. Okay. Thank you, Cynthia, once again for having me to uh, have an exposure about this shield. This is a project shield which has been developed and initiated by me in collaboration with the International Justice Mission for the cause of safety and security of the women uh, who are here. And is based on the project of uh, evidence-based practices, saying that I have to create a community, a society, a community free of violence, a community which is affording safety, which is affording security, and above all, protection to the women. So as a project, as a sample uh, access, I have started this in uh, Trichuraapalli range. This range covers five districts in my ranges, which covers Trichuraapalli district, Karur, Arilur, Perambur, and Pudukote. So as an initial stage, we have uh, delved into this aspect of evidence-based policing to protect women and children. The basic aspect of this to do a targeting of the data of last year, five years, there in the department. So I did an analysis of the last five years data and evolved six major crimes that are being reported and we identified the hotspots which are 100 police stations covering 150 villages and these hotspot locations in the Trichy range have been targeted so that we ensure that these areas there is a sensitization, there is an awareness, there's an overall change in the attitude and aptitude of the society from the side of the police as well as from the public so that as in collaboration, as in co-habitation, co we look for the protection of women at large. So the testing teams, we have developed strategies and activities and we have a tracking system to ensure that all these activities which have been done in collaboration with the uh, functionaries which are working with the district child and the women protection uh, departments and institutions as well as the NGOs and institutions, which are all uh, geared towards making the society, making this uh, system a protective system for the women and the children who are here in this society, so that they're protected against all the crimes that are being happening against them. So the project shield uh, basically involves four stages. In the first stage, as I've already told you, it involves a crime analysis. The five-year crime data has been analyzed and we have identified 100 hotspot police stations covering 150 villages where these crimes are more in number. The second stage is the strategic identification, which is now in the process. We are having our own about covered about 500 uh, uh, activities of uh, awareness camps, sensitization programs. We have also had webinars. And this project, which has uh, started off on 21-9-2020, has kicked off a very good uh, response from all walks of life, from all the NGOs, from all the child and women functionaries working in the stream, and even the state women commission, 
has commented upon us. And uh, recently, we've also developed uh, women and child friendly corners in our police station so that we give all assistance. We give a very cordial uh, atmosphere and an ambience which is protective, which is safety, which is friendly to those women and children who come to the police stations for uh, seeking legal assistance, seeking legal protection or legal uh, assistance of any form. So the third is the project and the activities implementation which is already in the field. We are covering five districts as I already told you in the Tirchapuri range. And then the final takeoff is the we need to have an impact analysis which will be done at the end of the study. So we have done the baseline survey and we need to have an end line. So as I already pointed out to you, the crime analysis looked upon the five years data and we have identified the six major crimes and the 100 spots and 150 villages. And the second aspect which looks uh, strategy identification, we wanted to have the increasing of the reportings also to facilitate convergence of all those uh, involved in this, area. in this area of our work. We need to create an awareness both communally, socially, social media, which is the talk of the town and we need to integrate all of them. We need to have a building capacity convergence. We need to have the capacity building for all those working in this field, for the police officers, for those working in the community, for those in the awareness side, for those uh, teaching side. So all of them together convergently, we have to fight this injustice and we are there to create a society, to create a community which is free of violence, ensuring there is safety and security and protection for the women and children. So the third stage, which is now the activities implementation stage, we have introduced our 24 helpline numbers. We have uh, two numbers covering our helpline uh, which is numbered as 63830718 and the next number is 9284501999. So through these, through these numbers, we receive complaints, we receive calls and immediately to our uh, uh, races, which is the RAP action, uh, community emergency forces, we attend to them, we also reach the hotspots, we also go to the victims, we make spot inquiries, we have veterans, we go to the victims, we reach to the victims, we reach to the people, we reach to the families, we reach to the people, the children, the police going to them at their doorstep, at their home, at their place of comfort, at their place of safety, we have organized our community-based awareness programs by the police as well as by the uh, panchayat who are engaged for fighting crime against women and children. And we have also the formation of women integrity networks. We have also conducted the capacity building trainings for police officials and for all the stakeholders of women and children protection functioning. So to re uh, reinforce, we have uh, these convergence trainings for the police officials and all for the NGOs and the stakeholders. We have the awareness programs in the hotspots. We have the district-wide rescue drivers for the women and children by the police. We have periodical inspections of all the children homes and the women homes. We have created a children and women-friendly police station corners. And we have the perpetrators accountability so that we ensure the completion of all the cases which are being reported. And we ensure successful prosecution, ensuring punishment for the... These are some of the activities which we have... Uh, which we have photographed. So you can see the numbers which have been exhibited. These are all the NGOs, are all our stakeholders, all the police in the field. So wherever possible, I also reach out to them. We see that they are being having an individual touch, personal touch, a woman-friendly touch, a touch of comfort, a touch of assistance, of uh, render of support. Above all, a support, which means a real support, an emotional support, a biological support, a support for life, a support for existence, a support for succor, a support for hope. So now we are into the impact analysis, which is to be done by one of our uh, Bharatidasan University. They'll be doing the inline study of the work that has been already posed by the police officials, by the NGOs, by the educational institutions, by the victims and the beneficiaries to ensure how far our work our evidence-based practices have been giving a good response so that we ensure that we attain the objective of creating a, a protective society for the women and children. So the major crimes that has been identified in our initial stages, domestic violence, women harassment, folks-related cases, 
sex trafficking, cyber crimes, and the child marriages. So these are the uh, significant uh, expressions of those figures. Where one can see that the highest has been reported in Tiriche, followed by the Pudukote, some cases, and also in Perambulu. And against those against children, we see that the Pokso rape cases are the dropping at the top, followed by kidnapping and abduction of children. And also, we have cases which represent only child marriage, which are only reported cases. So, this evidence based policing, we expect to have that utilization of this practice would be able to give us a 3T method to reduce the crime against women and children, to increase the performance of the police department, to increase the community and the visible policing, to increase the police public interaction, to change the perception of the public on the police, to have an increased deterrence among the criminals, and to increase the confidence of the vulnerable victims on the police department, and above all, to ensure that there's a decrease in the rates of the reports of the crime against women and children, and to ensure that city reign is declared as a crime-free zone, a protective zone, a protective community, a safe community, a secure, a secure community for the women and children. So thank you to all my uh, viewers and uh, to all the students. I thought it was appropriate to give this talk to you because when you think about the topic of writing, like women, now the question has been raised. I have given you the answer. Reaction and responses have to come from you. You know the question, you know the answer, you know the reaction. So let us all join hands and work towards uplifting our women. Yes, there is the system, there is the law, there is the protection, there is the framework. But we must make use of the framework. We have to join hands and make use of the existing framework, existing laws, existing provisions, and above all, retaliate where you have to. Retribute where you have to and voice out. Voice out all your problems. Voice out all your problems. Voice out all your problems. And to listen to the voice, SHIELD is there. I am there. We are there. SHIELD, safety and security is there to ensure the right to equality. Yes, it will be applied to women. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, on behalf of uh, the National Carrot Corps, Province College for Women. I am more than happy to first of all uh, thank uh, Dr. Annie Vijaya, Deputy Inspector General Richie Range. Uh, the way she went about the presentation being so crisp, explaining how the law for protection against women are in papers and how it is practically not happening in the society and she says that to bridge the gap you have to voice out and she has not only told us but she's also gone into action started setting this shield for the Pritchi range i hope that this continues across tamil nadu and across our entire country and at this moment i would extend my thanks to joseph who had introduced the chief guest and who has also helped our college, the National Cadet Corps of my college, Providence College, to get such a person of such esteemed uh, honor to present this particular webinar to enlighten how constitution has helped women 60, 70 years back and how the society has to change its framework so that what is in papers apply to day-to-day -day life. I also thank the person whose name was not mentioned who has created such a wonderful PowerPoint which was displayed excellently by Madam. At this juncture, I would especially thank the commanding officer of my Five Tamil Nadu Girls Battalion NCC who has been motivating young minds, especially women as being a girls battalion, and my principal Reverend Sister Sheila for having given us opportunities to animate webinars of this sort. And finally, I, I thank God who brings thoughts of this into our minds and help us turn it out into reality. So thank you one and all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.